today on the Scott Thompson Show on AM 900 CHML. Former First Lady Barbara Bush is in ailing health. According to uh, a source close to the family, she has decided to opt out of further treatment and proceed with comfort care. Uh, uh, Here is a clip from granddaughter Jenna Bush. I think the fact that they're together in this and he still says, I love you, Barbie, (laughs) every night is pretty remarkable. All right, let's bring in Andrew Oak, author, speaker, award-winning television producer, firstladiesman.com to find out more and with us now. Andrew, thanks for taking the time. We appreciate this. No, of course. Thanks for having me on to speak about this wonderful, wonderful first lady. Uh, This one seems to stand out for me, and I'm not sure if it's a generational thing or just the strength of this lady. She was a very dominant woman. Well, I, I think it's both. I think it's the age that a lot of people are, and this is... This is a modern first lady that has remained so active in her post-White House life. Uh, the, the Bushes themselves are an example for what a lot of people want to be. They, they met in the early 40s. They've been married 73 years, the longest living president and first lady to be married. Um, she is just an all-around good person. Every single person that I know, former administration, uh, butlers, stewards, secret service, when they are asked, who is your favorite first lady, their answer is always Barbara Bush. And it's the ones who have worked for multiple administrations. And it's just because she's a genuinely nice person. She remembers people's names, people's birthdays, names of pets. And she's always giving greeting cards and little presents. She's selfless, and she continues to be the matriarch of the Bush family. And she's a, she's a role model for all. Uh, talk about m- most weren't aware that she was ill. We certainly know of uh, uh, Bush Senior and, and his ailments and such. Talk about the health of both of them. Well, you know, the last time we saw both of them publicly was at the Super Bowl coin toss, and and she's wheeling yeah. him out. And and the former president does have some some form of Parkinson's, uh, uh, but but he still recently was jumping out of airplanes at and at Kenny Bunkport. She would wheel his chair out to the landing spot, and he would land with the Golden Knights and, and get back in the chair, and she'd wheel him back up into the house. And You've seen recent interviews where the family is there, and everyone's crying about how much they love each other, and Mrs. Bush is always the stalwart, the, the strength, and saying, oh, come on, everyone, pull it together. And she really has led this family. So it's, it's no surprise to me that her failing health is a bit of a surprise to most people because she is a strong, confident woman that is always pressed forward in all of her causes, philanthropic endeavors, and public service. And talk about her ailments. Well, I think at this point it's, it's a failing uh, uh, heart. It's a congenitive heart issue where she's lacking some oxygen. And for, by all accounts, she's been in and out of the hospital since Good Friday. And uh, she has decided that she wants to be comfortable. She wants to be in her own home. I, I don't uh, care to speculate uh, of, of what the, the end result of this would be other than uh, full recovery and, and, and good health for the future for her. Uh, again, she, she's still very, very active with her uh, literacy campaign and the reading uh, events that she does down in College Station. She is comfortable at home in Texas. She is surrounded by her loved ones. And I'm sure they will proceed with, with whatever's necessary to, to treat uh, her, her heart ailments or, or make her as comfortable as possible. Uh, how does Barbara Bush compare to other first ladies? Why does she stand out? Well, she stands out in that it's such a long history of public service. Um, Barbara Bush has kept scrapbooks for her life together with George H.W. Bush since they started dating in the 40s. It's all documented. It's all there, including their public service. The, the, uh, the, uh, President Bush is a former World War II pilot. There's articles about that all the way up through their work in China as ambassadors and working on foreign relations there. Head of the CIA, his uh, congressional uh, uh, career, and she has uh, campaign. She's 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 only one of two wives and mothers of a first lady. It's our modern day Abigail Adams who had the same uh, uh, connection. And so we know so much about this woman and so much of her life has been in public service. And like I say, one of the most longest living and productive post White House first ladies of all time in the reading work she does. She's also She's all over the United States. She's got a, a memorial hospital in Maine that does amazing work with terminally ill and ill children. She goes there on her birthday to read to children up until 
very recently, even sit down on the floor with them to be close to them, to read and show that kind of love that is outside of her family, from within her family to these children. And she just is a remarkable human human being, an example that people uh, uh, associate with. How difficult would it have been for her, and obviously proud, I'm sure, but how difficult would it have been for her to have both her husband and her son serve as president? Uh, it's, it's remarkably hard. I mean, you know, more and more, especially with social media and this past campaign, think about it. Her other son also ran, but he's in a presidential campaign where your, your business is out there and you hear people say horrible things about your loved ones. And to have that go through your husband, who you have been dearly married to for 70 plus years and two of your sons is remarkably hard. She even said the series that I produced with C-SPAN. The C-SPAN series was uh, uh, First Lady's Influence and Image, and Barbara Bush was interviewed for that series. And she said, when asked, what do you think about your son, Jeb, running for president? She said, I would think that the American people could find someone without the last name Bush and without the last name Clinton. I remember that. I remember that. I I thought it was hilarious because she's basically saying, why don't you guys pick another family? Like, what is it with us? Or the Clintons, for that matter. Um, exactly, she said to both. Yeah, she said, "Get, get, 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 start dipping in another pool, another resource." But when Jeb did run, she's the good mother. She is the matriarch of the family, and she does campaign for him. If that's what he wants to do, she will support that at sacrificing herself once again in what she would have to hear and endure about another member of her family or another son of hers. Do you think she helped uh, George Jr. get elected? Um, I think so. There, there, because the there, stability's that, there? Well, there, there's, there's that likability factor, you know? I mean, she's, as long as I can remember, and any public image we've had of this woman in, in, in the, the recent, you know, decades, she is a grandmother. She mm. is a, 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 a lovely, endearing kind of personality, a very warm and larger-than-life figure that we either want to be like or we assimilate, or she, she, she reminds us of our own grandmother. But, you know, you look for, as I did back in the, the, the photo albums there at College Station, it's probably the most intimate way to get to know someone, if you think about it. Think of your own families uh, or your own personal photo albums from back in the day. These are, these are family pictures around the Christmas dinner table, Thanksgiving dinner table, birthdays, building snowmen in the yard, vacations, fishing trips, people acting goofy, you know, mm. it, birthday parties. It's just a remarkable insight to someone's life and someone's soul, especially someone that we think we know because of this public persona. But we have to remember that all of these women and their husbands are human beings. They live, they laugh, they love, they lose, they win. You know, it, and, and these studies that I did for the C-SPAN series, it let these women step off the pages of history books and out of the oil paintings and become real people and things that we all have things in common with because we're all human. Do you think some thought that she was smarter than her son? Um, I think, you know, it, 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 going across the board, and this goes back to Lucy Hayes, the, the wife of, of, of uh, President Rutherford B. Hayes, post-Civil War, she said, the woman's mind is as strong, if not stronger, in certain areas than the men. I mean, behind every great man is an even greater woman, and these women, all of them, from Martha Washington on up to Melania Trump, they are all these great women behind these men that would become president, and they've been a part of the formation, the continuation, and the success of our country from the beginning. Many of our presidents marry up, and Barbara Bush is a perfect example of that. Hmm. Uh, what's it like to be First Lady? Um, everyone seems to handle this job differently, different levels of responsibility and such, different levels of likability. What's it like to live this role? Well, and, and Barbara Bush's daughter-in-law, Lauren Bush, Laura Bush, said it best. She said, the role of the First Lady is up to every First Lady. And keep in mind, these women are not elected, and they're not paid, and there's no job description. There's no First Ladies 101 that you can take in college. There's no training for this job other than the life these women have led up to that point. And many times, as it did in, in, in Barbara Bush's uh, uh, time in the White House, as Laura Bush's, Hillary Clinton, that role changes because of life events, uh, certain tragedies, wars, economic downpoint. And we look to this First Lady for so many things beyond what we look on as a president. 
We look at the president for policy. We look at, look at the president to lead. We look at the first lady and how to raise our children, what to eat, what to wear, hemlines. They get, they get celebrated or destroyed for what they're wearing at every turn. They're on the public stage as this ambassador to the world. And they travel around with this goodwill and this philanthropic endeavors that they all uh, uh, take up and support. And it is a hard role. You're constantly under the microscope. You're not only a wife, but you're a mother in most cases. And you're a public figure, again, that was not elected and is not paid. So it's very, very interesting to look at how each of these women set their terms as first ladies up to be and then how they develop them throughout the four to eight years that they're in the white house uh most are doing something uh some sort of public service in some way have a cause of some sort how important is it that they don't talk about politics or should they well it's it, 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 americans and and humans in general are very very fickle people with short-term memories and mob mentality that's just that's the way we are built and what's good for one first lady is not always good for another. Um, uh, Hillary Clinton, every, everything that she did to insert herself into politics, it, that broke every glass ceiling but the ultimate one of president. But she was the first first lady to be a senator, first first lady to be a secretary of state. Many of these first ladies indulge in politics and policy, and it works out well. But for some, it backfires, as it did in the end for the ultimate goal for, for Hillary Clinton. But the ones that choose, I use the word safer, it, it, because it's safe to stay out of politics. Politics is messy, messy business. And when a first lady takes up reading or children's health or women's rights across the globe, uh, they tend to do better in public opinion, and they tend to make more of a permanent difference. Because those are the causes, those are, that's the work that outlasts their time in the White House. That's the work that does not get repealed by the next Congress. Uh, it's the work that can continue and be their legacy as it is for so many first ladies, like it is for Barbara Bush in, in uh, um, uh, literacy and, and, and reading. Why do we like political families? Why are we quick to vote for someone who has the same name of someone else that led? You know, that's an interesting question. And again, you know, sometimes it works out well and sometimes it doesn't. There are, there are definitely more uh, one-timers in that we don't often vote. It, it, it's, it's unusual. It happened with the Adamses, and it happened again with the, uh, with, um, the, the, the Harrisons, and that was a, that was a grandson and, and grandfather issue or, or uh, situation. And then again with the Bushes, uh, again, a, a Clinton ran that was a wife, not a, not a, not a son or, or daughter, um, so, you know, it, it, it's, people speculate that Michelle Obama will run, even though she says that she doesn't want to. It really depends on how much you want to be tied to that relative and whether that works out and where those opinion polls are of that person's past presidency. But these people, we tend to like uh, younger, more attractive uh, first ladies with, with young families, and that's been over the course of history, the, the Tylers, the Clevelands, the, the Roosevelts, the, Theodore uh, and Edith Roosevelt, um, the, the Carters, the Clintons, all, all Obamas, Bushes had two young, young daughters in the White House. We like to see what we want to be. We want to be this successful nuclear picture-perfect family, and, and those are the type of people we like to see in the White House leading. I can't let you go, Andrew, without asking you your thoughts on Melania. Uh, we haven't heard much uh, about her as far as first ladies go and, and the things that you're describing. Um, some may say she seems distanced, not sure if she likes the role. Your thoughts? Well, my thoughts are this. You know, it, it, again, every first lady can, can make the role her own. And I think that the same people that said Melania Trump wasn't going to move to D.C. and didn't want to be first lady – are the, are the ones that are not congratulating her or at least mentioning when she does embrace this role. I think particularly of her trip to Houston, where she was slammed for wearing high heels to walk to the, to the, to the helicopter. Hmm. What people failed to realize was Melania Trump doesn't have to go to a hurricane uh, area. She does not have to accompany her husband anywhere. And the two previous first ladies, Michelle Obama and Laura Bush, wildly popular, with soaring poll numbers, did not go to hurricanes Sandy, Rita, and Katrina. Hmm. 
So if you flip the story on that and know your history of what these first ladies have done and feel they need to do and say Melania Trump embraces the role that other more popular first ladies in the past have not done and accompanies her husband to a hurricane-torn area for support, that's quite a different story. Um, she's, she's hugely popular on the international stage from her past work and the fact that she speaks multiple languages and is our second only foreign-born first lady. So I can't help but think that this helps her husband on the international stage. And her anti-bullying campaign, while not as public and as promoted as, say, uh, Nancy Reagan's Just Say No, she is doing a lot of work quietly and, and most importantly, leading by example when she is bullied by the media or social media even more so. She leads by example, ignores it, and just proceeds with her work and her way of life. So I think she's, she's blazing her own trails. And when we look back on her, I think, I think history will, will treat her very differently than, than some may see her in the public eye today. Do you think she enjoys the role? I think she enjoys children. Children is her main drive. When she's doing things with children, she is thriving. She is happy. She is reading to kids and doing the things that we've seen a lot of other first ladies do in the past. But in her first international trip last year when she accompanied her husband to Italy and parts of Europe, she was not happier on any part of the trip than she, when she was in orphanages and hospitals and telling little children that there was hope and there's a good life out there and spreading her message of, of positivity in that field. And that's one of the things that, that kept her out of D.C. initially. She said she wanted to, her son to finish school and then yeah. she would bring him to D.C., which she did. And, and other first ladies have done that, too, in protecting their children. It's hard enough to be a mom. It's got to be even twice as hard, if not more, to be a mother and first lady. And, and I, think she's, I think she's doing a very good job of it so far. How do you think Americans view her? I think Americans view her in a, in a number of different ways. I think, we, I think we like the glamour. I said very early in the campaign that she could be the next Jacqueline Kennedy, and some people got upset by that. And I said, well, let's look at this. She has a style. She has a grace. She has a dignity to her when she does go out on the stage. She's very familiar with, with the public being a former supermodel. And when women are dressed they're they're judged. They have been all the way back from you know to Martha Washington, Dolly Madison, things like that. So I think when people see her in that glamorous role of hosting or or accompanying her husband to uh, foreign events and being on that foreign stage, I think we look at her very positively. Um, she has the distinction or the unfortunate. Uh, 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 circumstance of, of being the second social media first lady. Mm. Michelle Obama had to deal with it, and now she's dealing with it, where people's criticisms go unchecked mm. and, and unregulated. You know, people can say what, whatever they want, whenever they want, and have a much larger audience and platform than they did before. And that's a tough thing to deal with. I think she's handling that very well. So, you know, people would like to see someone more popular, or, or not more popular, m more public. Uh, and that goes back to other first ladies that have done remarkable things behind the scenes. Bess Truman, Pat Nixon, a, a lot of those first ladies come to mind that have been highly influential behind the scenes at their husband's White House. Rosalind Carter would be another one that did that. Um, then you've got your first ladies like Betty Ford and Nancy Reagan and Hillary Clinton, uh, even Michelle Obama with her Let's Move and her, and her Vegetable Garden and things and eating healthy are very, very public. And now because we want so much information, we want that from all these first ladies. But not all first ladies are those massively public, look at me kind of first ladies. So she's a little more subtle, and I, and I think that takes people, uh, uh, gives people reason to second-guess her intention. Andrew Oak has been with us, expert on U.S. First Ladies, author, speaker, and award-winning television producer, firstladiesman.com to find out more. Andrew, thank you for the time. Much appreciated. Scott, thanks. Anytime. Lovely to be on with you today. Want to hear more? Download the podcast on iTunes or Google Play and listen to The Scott Thompson Show weekdays from noon to 3 on AM 900 CHML.